So welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Dr. Melinda Hall and I am uh, part of the Brown Center and happy to help moderate today's session with Dr. Tom Farrell. Um, we are very glad that he is here to present his research on the Reeves tale and some of the issues around dialect that come uh, with uh, scribal transmission of that text. And I'm looking very forward to hearing from him more about this project. Um, he has been with English Department since 1984, and we were very lucky to have him also as Interim Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences. Um, and uh, yes, take it away, uh, Dr. Farrell. I will be here as moderator and discussant for this uh, session. So add to the chat anything that you would like, and I will be moderating that as well. Great, <laughs> thank you, Melinda. And um, I will just add to what you have said that um, I prepared a, a presentation that will last a little over 30 minutes or so. Um, so I'm leaving plenty of time for discussion, question and answers. And we can either do that at the end or if something comes up um, as we're going, as I'm going through it, please, you know, I don't know if I'll see it if you raise your hand. So put it in the chat if I don't. And Melinda will, will um, share your questions and, and we'll deal with them. I will say real quickly that I'm going to talk about the sort of digital humanities part of it, which may be interesting to people um, at the beginning. And I'm gonna kind of move through that. Um, maybe don't interrupt that part too much and we can come back to it as much as you want afterwards, but I don't wanna get totally sidetracked on that. So I am going to um, share my slideshow with you. Are you all seeing a title slide? Yes, we can see it. Oh, Tom, I think that you have uh, been muted somehow. So if you would unmute yourself, that would be. He is reconnecting as we speak. Uh, he was okay. kind of a uh, connection issue. Yes, I agree with Vivian. This is beautiful to look at as that is. Okay, I just got a message saying I'm having connection issues, even though I'm hardwired in. So I, I apologize for that. Um, I don't know if what how much you heard of what I was saying before before I started circling, but I've been working since 2015 with a, a major digital humanities initiative called the Canterbury Tales Project. Um, my job within that is as editor of the Reeves Tale and a little bit of associated text. Um, all of this, of course, is part of Chaucer's Canterbury Tales, a poem written at the end of the 14th century. So my my job as editor has been uh, multifaceted. Um, I have been doing a lot of preliminary work using various software package, packages, which I'll just sort of zoom through. First of all, I transcribed about 30,000 lines of iambic pentameter from witnesses like the one that you're looking at here, British Library uh, manuscript Harley 7334. Actually, most of them don't look anywhere near as nice as this, and they're harder to read on, on the whole than this one is. Um, the next step in the process was to Okay, what do I do? I guess I click the next one. There we go. Um, the next step was to encode all of those transcriptions into extensible markup language um, shown here. This is, in fact, the passage that you were just looking at in the manuscript. Um, Harley 7334 is a pretty clean manuscript, so not a whole lot of, of markup going on in this one. The next step after that is to collate the readings found in all of the 58 manuscripts. So you can tell this is a screenshot, it's not the actual software. In the real software, if you run your mouse over any of the readings here, you would get a window popping up telling you which manuscripts have that reading. And I'll also pause here to say this is a pretty typical sort of line in which there are five lemmas. A lemma is a unit of collation, that's where where you notice the variation that exists in manuscripts. So at the beginning of this line, some manuscripts say, and this, others say for this, and probably just one or two say this. Um, and all of that would be visible in this, um, in this software. The next step then is um, to use the collation information, which establishes how often each witness agrees with the other ones, um, 
in order to analyze the relationships among all of the different witnesses. And I say, I say witnesses, that's the general term. Sometimes I'll say manuscripts, most of them are manuscripts, but there's a few early editions. Um, so I, I probably won't be careful enough in distinguishing those two, but I don't wanna make it more complicated than it needs to be. So this is, this is a variant map, which was generated using the phylogenetic software developed originally by biologists. Um, and adapted for use um, in analyzing textual traditions by CTP founder Peter Robinson. Um, as you can see here, one use of the, of the variant map is that it shows you in any lemma exactly which manuscripts have which readings, right? So um, in this one, um, you'll see almost all of them, the, the vast majority listed in red here have the reading is, but a couple of manuscripts say is a, uh, one says is the, and one just says ah. Uh. Um, and so you can do that with any lemma in the whole text that way. The other thing that I wanna show you about variant maps is the kind of information that they give you in general. So I've highlighted three manuscripts here to, to talk about this, one at the top called SE, HG on the left and GL on the right. Um, and if you followed the lines on the map from SE sort of down into the left and then left and then down to HG, there's actually a shorter distance between SE and HG than there is if you go down from SE and then down into the right, down to GL. And the fact that that's a shorter distance means that there are fewer points of disagreement, fewer lemmas in which SE and HG disagree than there are in which SE and GL disagree. But the map also shows you the way that manuscripts group together um, so that you'll see that SE is grouped in the same bunch with GL and a whole bunch, like 18 more different manuscripts um, that all come to a point together. And that's a different point than the group that HG is in with CH and 83 and H, HA5 and EL, et cetera. And that fact about the variant map tells you that SE shares the same readings with GL more consistently than it does with HG. And HG um, shares the same readings with CH and 83 and EL more. So we saw a question there and it just zoomed by. What was the question again? So the question in this case is about the physical distances of the lines. Uh, so they mm -hmm. follow how closely related or similar the manuscripts themselves are, correct? So not how closely related they are, but how similar they are. So just raw numbers of, of agreements between them. But um, the the point about SC and GL is that they share the same readings more often than SC and HG do. Thank you. Um, that question was from Vivian and she says that she understands, so thank you. Okay, great. All right, uh, so by the end of the, my fall 2019 sabbatical, I had basically finished all of the work that I had just described. And today what I wanna do is talk about um, a project that I was working on during my 2020 summer grant in which I used what my application for that grant called the quote, incomparably good data set that I had just generated um, to address other questions about the manuscripts of the Reeves tale. What you need to know about the Reeves tale is that it's the first text in English to use regional dialect as a strategy of characterization. It tells the story of a conflict between a miller living outside of Cambridge, so that's central England, and two students from the university, who we are told were both born in a town called Strother. Fair in the north, he cannot tell a where. Right? So because of that, the student speech is riddled with the representation of various kinds of northern dialect. Pronunciations like na, where we would say no, or grammatical structures like is, where we would say I am, it would be Iam in, in Southern Middle English. And um, just vocabulary items like fawn um, instead of the, the more common word fool. And all of those examples are more or less restricted to the Northern part of England in the early 15th century. So it was uh, J.R.R. Tolkien, yes, the author of The Hobbit, 
who first theorized the uh, extent of Chaucer's northern dialect program in this tale. Tolkien actually created a text of the dialogue by these two students that resembles no extant manuscript because he accepted any northern dialect construction that he found in the six manuscripts that he studied and then generalized those forms throughout the tale. No one has followed Tolkien's editorial lead, but all of the commentary about the dialect issues still rests on assumptions about what Chaucer actually wrote and about how scribes copied what he wrote. And those assumptions, while they're less extreme than Tolkien's, are still totally unsubstantiated. So the primary goal of my research is to put our understanding of the scribal treatment of the text on firmer ground. I probably should start with a quick summary of what we already know about scribes in the 15th century. First and crucially, there was no standard dialect of Middle English. That is, speakers in one part of the island never felt any sense that people in a different part of the island spoke a better or a more prestigious version of the language. I can still remember being in graduate school and being startled that a fellow student of mine from Alabama would say at parties that she knew she didn't speak correct English. I mean, she also knew that that was a wrong attitude, uh, linguistically speaking, that all dialects are equal. But we have a standard dialect in English and, and in American English, and she didn't speak it and knew about that. So that's what we mean by a standard. That situation was beginning to change by the time of Chaucer's death in 1400. There was a a bureaucracy that was beginning to build up in Westminster, and it was enforcing a mostly London-based dialect. But in any case, scribes habitually translated um, the exemplars from which they copied either, um, yeah, okay, either into their own speech or the dialect that they were trained to use in official um, documents. And because of that, scholars have reasonably postulated three kinds of copying as typical of the 15th century. So first of all, the scribe may leave the language of his exemplar more or less unchanged, but this appears to happen somewhat rarely. Second, um, the uh, scribe may convert it into his own kind of language, making innumerable modifications to the orthography, the morphology, and the voc vocabulary. Um, that's what we just examine the three different kinds of, of uh, linguistic traits that might be tied to dialect. And this is what happens commonly. Um, this is the translating that I was just talking about. Or the scribe may do something somewhere between A and B, and I'll say a little bit more about that in just a second. Um, in fact, it was later scholars who showed us more about this process of translation and the details of how it worked. <clears throat> um, so this, this very important article by Benskin and Lang um, emphasizes these points. Once in a while, a form will just slip through. The scribe will, will just copy what he sees instead of translating it, but that's very rare. Second, and crucially, scribes will copy words that exist in what they call their, his passive repertoire, and they will do that more or less readily. And the passive repertoire it consists of forms that are not part of the scribe's own dialect, but, quote, which are nevertheless familiar in everyday usage as the forms of other writers, and that the scribe does not balk at reproducing. I love that final clause in that. Um, so scribes never attempt to create the mixed dialect, that type C thing that, that I showed you on the previous slide. But the act of repeated copyings and the fact that the passive repertoire will, will uh, this one scribe's passive repertoire will filter out the original dialect in one way, in one copying, and a different scribe's passive repertoire will then filter it in a different way in another copying. That's where we get these manuscripts that seem to have a mixed dialect in them. So it's the process of repeated copying that produces that. And finally, there's this process called working in by Benskin and Lang, which means that the scribe takes a while to sort of get used to the dialect. And typically, not always, but typically, will copy more of the original dialect forms at the beginning and then gets used to it and produces um, a more consistent dialect later on. Okay, finally, um, in terms of what about scribes, 
there's this interesting thing that scholars belonging to two very different schools, one of them thinks of scribes as kind of misbegotten beings who exist only to introduce error into our texts, and the other who, in contrast, emphasizes the extraordinary care that most scribes took to get it right, both of these scholars arrive at essentially the same understanding of how accurately scribes typically copied their exemplars. So no matter what your sort of ideology about scribes is, you're going to expect about 90%, 98% accuracy. Okay, with that background, it should be clear that the scribal task Chaucer posed in the Reeves tale required scribes to work completely against the grain of their training. He was asking them to A, notice that there was a consistent program of northern forms in this text. B, correctly delimit that program to the speech of the two students. And that's particularly difficult because in Middle English, there's no such thing as quotation marks. So you don't know when the students are speaking just by looking at the page. And C, accurately reproduce those northern forms in those speeches. Given how big a challenge that is, questions are pretty straightforward. To what extent did scribes seek to reproduce Chaucer's northern dialect program in the Reeves tale? And secondly, to what extent did they succeed? It's probably clear from all of that that a huge concern has been to define an appropriate methodology for my research. So I began by compiling a list of all of the northern items in the speech of the students, beginning with Tolkien's inventory, removing a few items that later scholars have shown were actually pretty standard in Chaucer's dialect, and then adding others suggested by other scholars or things that I found in the textual record. My plan was to be generous and, and err on the side of inclusion rather than exclusion when I started. So I began with a questionnaire that identified 201 such items. And let me define item for you. An item is a lemma or a part of a lemma in which some scribes wrote a phonological or morphological or lexical form that is identifiable as contrastively Northern in 1400. So you can tell that's a pretty technical sort of, of definition there. Um, but uh, any, any lemma or part of a lemma where you could say, oh, that looks like it might be Northern, um, that's, that's one of my 201 items. As I've suggested, some items contain more than one lemma. So in this line, um, which is usually printed as quote John and say who got us the corn does in, we have one lemma that is an item, the, the vocabulary item who got us. Um, but then we have another one toward the end of the line, the vowel in the word gas is a northern vowel, we would say goes, right? And then yet again, that ending on that verb um, S instead of the, the sort of TH that was common in Middle English and that you're probably all familiar with from reading Shakespeare, right? The TH ending on third person verbs. Um, all of those are separate items, three items in uh, two lemmas there. Yeah, okay. Um, that was important to do because it allowed me to classify the different kinds of Northern forms that existed. Well, this is all supposed to be centered, but that's okay, right? So you can see that you can have a northern vowel A with either a northern inflection or a southern inflection, although that, 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 that one doesn't actually occur. And similarly, you can have a southern vowel with either a northern inflection or a southern inflection, and both of those do occur. So the next step was to compile the data. On the first what were many, many, many spreadsheets. I recorded for each item an index number, the line in which it occurs, its linguistic category, the chronological segment of the tale in which it occurs, the position in the line at which it occurs, and the text or token copied in each of the 58 witnesses. I don't know if any of those tokens are, are visible to you or not, um, but you can see that there's just a bunch of different words that are um, sitting there in that spreadsheet. The next step was to just make a copy of this spreadsheet and then um, to start working on that one by replacing each token with a zero or one by applying in each category a pretty simple rule that said this is northern or this is not northern. So if it was northern, it got a one. 
If it was not northern, it got a zero. Cool, thanks, Melinda. Okay, um, in that way, I got 10,743 tokens. Um, but unfortunately, they did not tell me a whole lot, um, didn't give me a whole lot of insight into the practice of scribes immediately. Some witnesses, some manuscripts, had relatively high scores for including uh, northern tokens. And by that, I mean 70, 75 percent was about the highest. Um, the lowest scores ranged through the 30 percent. Um, a, ph a phenomenon that all of us faculty are, are well acquainted with and compression, right? No, no real high scores, no real low scores, um, everything sort of bunched up in the middle. Um, that kind of compression made answering my, my basic questions more difficult. Um, but it was pretty easy to see why that was happening. Um, in some categories on my questionnaire, Northern forms were almost never copied. And in other categories on my questionnaire, they were almost always copied. I'll give you quick examples of, of those processes. So Tolkien thought that Chaucer had intended to spell the HW phoneme, so the first sound in the word whistle, um, with a northern Q pretty consistently. And that spelling does occur in the token whistle that you're looking at there. But that single word in that one manuscript is the only one of 473 tokens to use that spelling. Um, on the other side of the slide and at the other end of the spectrum, scores were inflated by the originally northern omission of an N inflection on infinitive forms of the verb. So in this phrase, hey shall not scapa is what's written in the manuscript. Um, Originally in Middle English, that would have been he shall not scapen, uh, but beginning in the north, people started leaving off the ends. Um, and the, apparently during the 15th century, that habit moved south so that um, in, the, in the textual record of the Reeves tale, um, scribes copied such items without an end more than 91% of the time, making their behavior in those items pretty useless for differentiating mirror or exact copying from uh, translating, translated copying. So there was a pretty simple solution. I eliminated from my database all items that scored either zero or one more than 85% of the time. Um, that process clearly increased the meaningfulness of my data, but there were some other issues that remained. So I will, I will just sort of slide over the next couple of steps, ask about it in the Q&A if you like. Um, but I'm going to describe the two processes that, pro that produced really useful results for me. First of all, I identified the 19 witnesses that most consistently copied northern tokens into the largest number of the 24 categories that remained in my database. These I provisionally uh, classified as type A witnesses, the ones most likely to have copied their exemplars exactly. Then, and attending only to the tokens in the type A witnesses, I identified the 13 categories in which Northern tokens most commonly appeared. And I call these the persistently attested categories, PACs, I will refer to them. So I'm now down to 87 from originally 201 items. I'm down to 87 items that exist in the persistently um, attested categories. And the treatment of those items in all 58 witnesses generated most of the conclusions that I'll discuss today. The first conclusion is crucial. These are spread across different parts of the phylogenetic map of witness relations. And this offered good evidence Osser himself wrote Northern tokens in those 87 lemmas. Um, and in fact, most of those in, in the PACs, more than 85% of the witnesses typically have a Northern token. Um, I'm gonna pause here again and say one more thing about the variant map. Um, two things here, the, the type A witnesses are printed in red so you can see them. Um, and you'll see that, that they occur in different branches of the map. And that's a basic principle of editing, that a reading that appears in different um, branches of the tradition, the textual tradition, 
is much more likely to be original. And the other basic principle of editing is that readings that appear in the most accurate um, copies of the text are most likely to be original. And the type A witnesses fulfill both of those. They're, they're spread among the group A, and I'm sorry, you know, group A, type A, it's gotta be confusing, but I inherited all of this terminology, so there it is. The group A witnesses up there at about one o'clock, um, the group CD witnesses at 3.30 or so, the O witnesses down at six o'clock. These are the, the very best witnesses from all sorts of, of uh, evidence that we have. And the fact that they are also agreeing um, on these um, northern items gives us very strong confidence that these are our Chaucerian readings. So um, Chaucer's northern program for the for the tale may very well, or as I will explain in a moment, it certainly does extend beyond the PACs. It's very helpful to have some set that I can say, yes, these these were um, in Chaucer's original, because that allows for a much better study of what scribes did with what we know was in Chaucer's original. The 14 witnesses that were least likely to contain northern tokens in the PAC items were um, classified as type B or translated texts. But even those witnesses contain, on average, about 28% of the northern tokens they encountered. And the reason, as I noted a while ago, is that scribes will consistently copy forms that exist in their passive repertoire. And you can see that going on in, in this subset of the data from uh, Cambridge University Library II-326, um, which I was really happy to be able to put up here because it's a, it's a manuscript that um, former Stetson student Jake Moore did some good work on a few years ago. So I always like to, to um, show up II and brag on Jake a little bit. Um, you can see that II mostly just translated all of the Northern tokens away, but in three or four items, it recognized um, from the passive repertoire or maybe even the active repertoire, um, the, the forms that were found in the exemplar and copied them into this. Um, that's very typical of the behavior of type B. Oh, come on, page turn. Okay. Um, from all of this, I deduced two forms of scribal error, um, and, and I'll say a little, I'll read them and then I'll explain it, um, that exist in copies of the Reeves tale. The first is a categorical failure to preserve most or all individual examples of one category of Northern forms. That's the really distinctive thing in, in the copies of the Reeves tale. And the second is related to what we know about scribes in general the sporadic failure to avoid translating a token in a category whose significance the scribe usually recognizes. So the scribe originally makes, mis or you know, occasionally makes mistakes. And, and I just want to explore um, the ways in which scribes make sporadic mistakes a little bit further. That first process, the process of categorical loss of Northern forms, helps to explain why certain Northern readings that can pretty easily be recognized as Chaucerian do not meet the criteria for persistently attested categories. So there's a spelling S-A-L um, for the modern word shall, um, that's a Northern form. And I've listed here um, how often out of the 10 times in which um, it might occur in the Reeves tale, each of these manuscripts has copied SAL. And you'll see that there are five genetically diverse, really good um, witnesses that copy it at least 80% of the time. Um, and that's excellent evidence that, that Chaucer wrote SAL. It's very unlikely these scribes would just do that by themselves. Um, but SAL is not found very often. And if you look down at the bottom, you've got three that have pretty clearly just sort of whiffed on this. They looked at cell and said, that's just a spelling mistake. And they started writing shall instead and, and kept, that all the way, kept that up all the way through. Um, two near the bottom, CH and AD3. These are two of the four manuscripts that we now generally think of as the best manuscripts of the Canterbury Tales. Um, and um, so even, even these excellent scribes 
are capable of totally missing out that on some parts of the northern program. It bears repeating that given the original characterization that type A copying occurs only somewhat rarely, the fact that about one third of the scribes copying the Canterbury Tales clearly prioritized more or less unchanged copying of Chaucer's original is pretty impressive. But as this list, thanks, slide, as this list of even the best type A witness indicates, no scribe was immune from those sporadic failures to copy the unfamiliar tokens to be found in the exemplars. You'll remember scribes typically copied at a rate of about 98% accuracy. Um, now, given the challenge presented by the Northern program, it's probably not reasonable to expect that kind of accuracy in a data set like the one that I'm working with which constitutes a kind of worst case scenario for scribes. But the score of 92% in the manuscript called EL or Ellesmere and the one called HG or Hengert, um, even so, that's not terribly impressive. And clearly, Ellesmere and Hengert are doing much better than even the other type A witnesses. Ellesmere and Hengert have long been considered the best manuscripts, the most accurate manuscripts by Chaucer editors. Um, both of them were written by the same scribe. Both of them are very early by about 1408 or so. But even so, in Ellesmere and Hengert, there are seven items in the PACs where at least one of them copies a Southern token. Um, and in all of these cases, the witnesses, uh, the evidence of the other type A witnesses shows that Chaucer intended the Northern token. So the evidence in Ellesmere and Hengert demonstrates that the process of sporadic loss of originally Northern forms contributes significantly to the current text of every witness to the Reeves tale. None of them really reproduced a more or less unchanged copy of the tale. And when I write this up into an article, that will be like in bold and, and italicized and everything because it's a major argument against one school of editing that's that's pretty dominant today. It's also interesting to note that there is undeniable evidence that scribes occasionally added northern tokens that could not have existed in their exemplars. The clearest cases come in lines where the textual record inarguably demonstrates that Chaucer wrote a word with no dialect implications a form that's used both in the North and in the South. But at several such lemmas, a few scribes substituted a different word, one in which Northern and Southern dialects could be and indeed were distinguished. So in the slide you're looking at, every manuscript that is printed in red or in green has a form of the word heart um, in different spellings. That's why there are the different um, colors there. And you'll see that all of the witnesses in that group A, all of the witnesses in that group CD, all of the witnesses called O, all of them have heart, which means Chaucer wrote heart. But off in the upper left part of the diagram, there are a few uh, manuscripts where the scribes wrote either sola, which is a southern form, or saula, which is a northern form. Um, and so clearly the scribes, at some point, some scribe just decided he was going to stick in um, a northern form there. All of these patterns of scribal behavior will make the Reeves tale more challenging to edit than most Chaucerian texts. I will use one category, not a PAC, to illustrate the challenges. Humbly requesting room and board for the night from Simkin the Miller, John the student quotes this proverb, he have heard said man sal ta of twa thingus sleek as he findus or ta sleek as he bringus. So leaving aside the other variants that are printed in blue, we may note that the Hengert manuscript on the bottom twice copies the word swilk, meaning such, which was common in the north, but also found in central England. At the same points, the Ellesmere manuscript twice copies the more determinedly northern form sleek. And as you can see on the right of this slide, oh dear God, I'm sorry about that. Um, as you can see on the right, Ellesmere, this didn't happen 
when I reviewed my PowerPoint this morning. Um, Ellesmere repeats the same sleek token twice later in the tale where Hengert uses it only once. It has been argued that repetitions of sleek are evidence of, quote, attempts by the Ellesmere editor or scribe, sorry, to increase the representation of Northern dialect. But the patterns of scribal behavior that I have traced make that an insufficient argument. In the broader textual tradition, two related witnesses register five sleek tokens in these lines, and counting Ellesmere, four others have four. Okay, yeah. Among the type A witnesses, again, these are the ones that are most sensitive to dialect, those in the genetically linked group A in the sort of light blue color all across both of these um, tables. Um, the, the, the group A manuscripts almost always copy sleek, 92% of the time where Hengert does not contain it. But in the similarly authoritative group CD, sleek appears in only 10% of the tokens. In the other authoritative witnesses, the, the O ones, it occurs about half the time. Um, you can explain this in all sorts of ways. Maybe the A manuscripts came from um, an exemplar in which a scribe had decided to throw in more northern forms to make it more northern. Um, on the other hand, it's equally plausible that the CD witnesses had an ancestor that was that didn't recognize sleek and so just substituted, i.e. translated, um, with the word swilk instead of the word sleek. You can look at the pretty meager evidence in the O witnesses and sort of squint at it a little bit and say, well, it, it, it uses the Northern forms more in the latter passage than in the earlier passage. So did that happen because the scribes looked at Sleek at the beginning and said, that can't be right and wrote Swill, but then 40 lines later, they saw it again and said, oh, well, it must be right and copied it. Or did those O witnesses copy accurately all the way through? And is there in fact a change in the usage of the students between the first passage in which they're asking for a favor from somebody who's not very friendly and who's not from the North, um, code switching as it were into a, a more Southern dialect. But when they're complaining to each other later on, they revert back to their Northern dialect. We just don't know. The last time I gave a spotlight presentation, Michael Denner reflected that for his work, the text that Tolstoy's readers read was a lot more important than the one that the novelist wrote. Well, there is and should be a lot of give and take on such questions. There should also be a lot of attention paid to the process by which the text that Chaucer wrote becomes the text that readers read. And at this point, the assumptions that scholars are making about the role of dialect in the Reeves tale range from a belief that scribes consistently defaced Chaucer's serious, although pretty obscure, desire to leave us a careful representation of Northern speech, um, to, on the other hand, a sense that scribes were diligently and accurately reproducing Chaucer's free reading and rather satirical mockery of that speech. Clearly, we have no right to any real confidence about any such assumptions. I don't have any definite conclusions yet, and the answers that I ultimately will have to come to will never be definitive, but my research has already shown that neither of those answers is very likely because there is, although there's always a limited set of questions inherent in the process of scribal transmission, those questions have been multiplied by the fact that the scribal transmission in this tale had to deal with the, the big additional variable of dialect. So my goal of generating just some good data about a few of those latter questions will, I hope, point the way to better answers. Thanks. How do I get rid of this? Thank you so much, Tom. You should be able to stop sharing by clicking on the stop on the upper right hand corner of your screen, the stop uh, there, button. Yeah, good. There Thank you. Yep. Too long since I've done a class in Blackboard. <laughs> um, 
Here we go. So thank you so much. I um, have a number of questions to kick us off, um, some of which are smaller and some of which are bigger. Actually, none is terribly small. Um, but maybe I'll just ask about the what I understood previously to be the kind of er text of the of Chaucer. And I could very easily be wrong, which is the 1476 Caxton text. Is that part of your variant map or is it a sort of touchstone in a different way? No, it's part of the variant map. Um, okay. But the, the 1476, some scholars would say 77 Caxton oh. edition, is, is not a really good text. It's part of one of the weakest families, group, um, group B. And so a few years later, Caxton produces another version of the Canterbury Tales. And he's got this great preface where he tells the story about some irate customer coming in and saying, this is a really crappy version of the Canterbury Tales. My father has a much better manuscript. And, and so Caxton says, so I asked if I could borrow it to make, to make a new edition. And he said, okay. And for hundreds of years, people just thought he was making this up. But in the last 50 years, people have shown this is basically exactly what happened. So Caxton 2 is a better text than Caxton 1. Okay, yeah, thank you so much. I, I was quite cur curious about that because when you were talking about your methodology, I found myself wondering about, I don't know, that question of how do you know if your methodology is a success and how do you do so without a kind of er text, right? Um, and so sort of relatedly, I was thinking about um, AI problems when people want to set a problem to which they don't know the answer to a computer to see how it does. Well, how do you know how it does, right? And yes. so and it was kind of related to, <laughs> related to my methodology curiosity. Yeah, well, this, is, this is what the humanities do, right? Is, is yeah. we investigate um, non-repeatable mm -hmm. human phenomena. And, and because of that, we don't, we don't have answers that we can, you know, we don't have bedrock answers that we can appeal to. Um, but, you know, I have the sort of brain that thinks that's kind of fun. Yeah, yeah, and I I am absolutely drawn in as well uh, to what you've been describing, um, and I definitely want to sort of leave open to everyone. Please join in with any questions that you have. I have several more prepared to ask, um, and I hope they'll lead to others for folks who are here. Um, Joel, hi Tom, um, thank you so much for this. This is this is uh, it's a delight to sort of, to hear this. Uh, and I'm glad to hear, glad to see other folks working in this this kind of field. Um, so I, I have several larger and smaller questions, a little bit like Melinda, but um, I think it might be helpful, even for me, in fact, um, if you could explain how it is that that um, you've determined without without. Chaucer's original, how it is that that the field determines that, you know, Hangert and Ellesmer are the most accurate and that and they calculate things at a 92% rate. Like how do they how do people infer um, errors and accuracies and things like that? Yes. Okay. And I saw a question um, from Thank you for the suggestion. Um, I saw a question from Vivian too, which I think is related to this. Um, so yeah, this has been a problem in any sort of the the term for it is schematic, right? An attempt to sort of figure out where there are errors that are shared. For for generations, people have sort of recognized if we don't know what's the correct text, how do we know? that this is an error that's being shared rather than a correct reading that's being shared. Um, and this was the problem that Peter Robinson tackled and he decided to use the, the biological software um, to, to see if he could get somewhere. And, you know, there's a sort of obvious metaphorical correlation. The, oh, Jesus, <laughs> the, uh, the, Biological software is looking, if you like, at texts, right? At strings of C, A, G, T, all of the different, um, uh, what are they? They're acids, I guess, in, in DNA, all of the, the, the elements of DNA um, and the order in which they appear. And it just compares those strings um, to one another in different organisms. And so he said, maybe we can do the th same thing. But the variant map is mapping out places where 
manuscripts or witnesses agree with one another. It's not mapping out um, where they share an error. It just, it's, it's simpler than that. So there's an additional step that has to be gone through in which you demonstrate that, for instance, the group A manuscripts, um, the ones up by one o'clock on the variant map there, um, the, the group A manuscripts um, have the same readings that don't appear in any of the other groups. Um, and then you need some kind of constant. This is back to what Melinda observed. And because for 150 years now, scholars have agreed that Ellesmere and Hengert um, are very, very accurate, um, that's what he used as the basis. It, if it's an error, it's not going to be in Hengert and Ellesmere. And the, the basic point is it worked, right? It's empirically effective um, to sort the manuscripts in this way. Did I answer your question, Joel? Yes, you did. You did. Um, okay. And thank you. Yeah. And I think I have a question that follows on that. Um, I just got curious about two different groups uh, that may be already involved in your Canterbury Tales project or perhaps are potentially involved. I was thinking about statisticians and artists. <laughs> mm -hmm. I, I saw so much of what you were doing, especially if I understood it correctly, and how you eliminated or reduced the number of PACs as being statistics questions, right? And then so much of the sort of morphology is also, I mean, someone with an artistic bent, I assume, could go really wild with some of this. Are any of those folks already involved in your uh, Canterbury Tales project? So, um... I sort of developed this kind of on my own. I mean, I, I didn't consult with, on these specific questions with other people, um, but I've been having a lot of conversations with Robert Askew over the last year, and we have a related project that we're working on. There's actually another whole question, which I just totally bracketed out of, of this project. Um, there's a theory that says that Chaucer also gives the narrator of this tale a Norfolk dialect, which would be different from the northern dialect that the students have. Um, so he and I are doing a much more purely statistical analysis of the type A witnesses to see um, how they treat the places where there might be um, a Norfolk dialect. So yeah, yeah. And, and I've just learned a lot just from talking to Robert as well about how statisticians deal with these sorts of questions. So, um, and we'll continue with this large group discussion. Anyone, please do raise your hand and then unmute yourself um, to ask a question. Uh, and I have, uh, I'm happy to ask another one of the questions that I had. Um, I'm very interested in bureaucracy. And you had mentioned that there was an emerging bureaucracy prescribed in London at this time. And I'm just wondering if the correlation there with the sort of first dialectic text or, or sorry, not dialectic, <laughs> dialect <laughs> text, um, if, it's, if that correlation might reveal anything. Was there sort of an emerging bureaucracy at the same time as there were new texts or anything that you've noticed like that? This would probably push beyond what I know, um, but I can talk a little bit about what I know. Um, so there's always a tendency for a centralized government to, to standardize whatever. Um, in, since, since 1700 or so, that hasn't been a factor in language standardization because there's already a standard language um, which gets used. Although, I mean, if you look at, at England, right, um, you've got, you've got the, the language of, that's taught to students at Cambridge and Oxford becoming the de facto language of the government because everybody who's in the government went to Oxford or Cambridge. Um, so, so you've got that. But in old English times, um, there are standard dialects that move around depending on where the, the strongest political authority is. Um, and the, the thing that changes in the Middle English period, so between 1100 and 1500, is that for a long time, the, the Northern Norman kings um, don't have a fixed seat of government. They're, they're always on the move. They're, they're imposing themselves on all of the barons and making them pay for their upkeep, basically. Um, but as England becomes um, a little richer, a little more important, 
um, the, the governmental functions tend to increase and that just becomes too cumbersome. So the government kind of settles down in Westminster. And when that happens, there's a desire to have government documents produced in a consistent form of the language. And that happens toward the end of the 14th century and on through 1425 or so. Um, it's hard to connect, it, it, it's hard, especially for me, because I don't know this, to, to figure out where Chaucer fits into that. Chaucer is a government employee. His, his real job is what we would call a civil service job. Um, he lives in London, um, so he's, he's dealing with this. this. Many of the scribes who copied the early manuscripts also worked in government offices. Um, so they, they would be using this kind of standard um, most of the time. Does that get at it? Absolutely, and I understand, I mean, it's just kind of a point of curiosity for me, it just, you know, it drew my attention in, in your talk, mm -hmm. and I understand it would have to be a bit of speculation, and sort of similarly, when I imagine all of these government employees racing around, talking with each other, potentially writing letters to each other, I just keep thinking about whether or not they were sort of discussing dialect as a problem, right? But again, like, unless we had a lot of records of letters, you can't really know if they thought dialect was like a, an exciting opportunity for inscribing <laughs> or a problem. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I'm sure there is some evidence and there are people who, who are interested in those questions and know a lot more about it than I do, but I don't know what the answers are. So um, would anyone else like to uh, air any further questions? Uh, Joel? Yeah, actually, I don't want to step on um, uh, Vivian or, or Alyssa if, if you guys have, if you all have any questions. I'm guessing at the moment, possibly not. Um, so, so Tom, you, you said that uh, the fact that um, there are no, you know, really accurate scribes who are really accurate at re reproducing Chaucer's version of this northern accent, right? And right. that fact really cuts against um, one of the schools of textual editing, right? Or yeah, the sentence in my draft is, there is no best text of the Reeves tale, which you will understand the, the implications of. So this is this is kind of circles back to my first question, then, doesn't it? It's it's, it's we don't assume there's a best text, and, and and we don't use a single rooted stemma. Well, what I'm not sure what you mean by we. I mean the the editorial tradition of the Canterbury Tales has been, I would argue, in most ways best text driven since Skeet in 1870 or whenever he was, right? Um, Skeet found Ellesmere and looked, said, wow, what a great manuscript, and basically reprinted it. And we sort of chipped away at that a little bit, and we've had a couple of people to say, no, it's not Ellesmere, it's Hengert that's the best manuscript, and they'd print Hengert. Um, but, but most of what's out there is basically either Ellesmere or Hengert. And because they're both very good, and they agree about 95% of the time, that's been good enough to teach from, basically, but we don't have a critical text of Chaucer at all. And what I'm saying is that that problem becomes acute and it goes beyond um, the good enough to teach from stage in the Reeves tale, where we can't even make a good guess at why Chaucer included dialect, which he obviously put a lot of effort into doing. Um, is this satirical? Is this, is this, um, some other kind of characterization. I, I, I can quote five different scholars who give totally different explanations of it. And we just need to figure it out a little bit more before we speculate anymore. Yeah, um, I, yeah. so I guess what's occurring to me is, is that um, the kind of editing that you're doing and the, and the kind of editing that Peter Robinson's doing, um, would you say that it, it, it sees itself as performing a kind of reading and that almost all reading takes the author's intent as, as a, 
a direction somewhere, right? It's sort of, it's desirable to try to figure out the author's intent, even though we know we can't. And we know that we're reconstructing it along the way. Mm -hmm. um, and that certain schools of textual editing go out about it one way, but there are other, whole other critical schools that are going about reconstructing that meaning in, in other ways. Is that, is that a yeah. way to put it? Um, so it will actually be fun. Um, the Reeves Tale will be the first um, edition published out of the Canterbury Tales project in its current phase. There are there are those old CDs that exist, but they don't. They just basically contain the the data and some commentary on the data. Um, so I'm in the process of negotiating right now with Peter and Barbara Bordalejo. Um, because their focus is on establishing the text that the scribes copied from, so not Chaucer's original. So it'll be a little bit different, um, and that's really that's really how they define the the goal of the Canterbury Tales project. Um, but they're also perfectly open to my adding to that my sense of of what the original might have been like. And you know that'll be different in a few points um, than than the one that we'll publish as the the CTP text, as it were. Thank you. I also would need to write a big article for studies in the age of Chaucer, um, exploring all the theoretical questions that you just brought up. <laughs> Um, so I think maybe to wrap up our session, I'd love to just ask sort of the obvious question, which is, did COVID-19 sort of interrupt your archival work, or was there a less interruption because you are working primarily digitally? Yeah. Um, so first of all, this is the kind of, I mean, the, the Canterbury Tales project has images, some better than others, of all of the, all of the manuscripts, um, and I can work from that. Um, frequently, it's it's either crucial or highly valuable to visit the manuscripts themselves and to study them. Um, but I did a lot of that in 2017, and again in September 2019. So sort of getting in under the under the gun there. Yeah, you um, just made it. <laughs> um, there are a couple, especially Litchfield Cathedral, a really interesting manuscript that I need to get to look at. I've made three appointments for one reason or another. Every one of them has gone by the boards. So there's been a little bit of frustration from that. But the other thing that I'd say is the, the kind of work that I've been doing here, you know, sort of clicking through the spreadsheet and saying northern, not northern, you can do that for 20 minutes if 20 minutes is what you've got. And, and so it's a very interruptible kind of work, and a lot of it um, was not much affected by, by COVID.